Okay, so uh, if you recall last time, we basically talked about um, optical flow, right? That was the main idea, was that we want to um, produce a correspondence between images. So this is my image one, and this is my image two. The idea behind optical flow was for every point in image one, x, y, I want to find a vector uv that points to some corresponding point x prime y prime in image two, right? And so this was the idea: is that you know we want to do, and, I, and just to give you a preview of what's going to happen. So um, I talked a little bit about why we want to use optical flow for things like uh, retiming or moving patterns of texture from one place to another, and then basically two lectures from now, I'll talk about more applications of all the stuff that we talked about throughout this chapter, specifically for visual effectsy kind of stuff. So really, the first few chapters, or the first few lectures in this chapter are more about fundamentals, and then I'll talk about the applications at the end. So um, in optical flow, right, we basically don't put any sort of constraints on what that vector uv could be, right? We're basically saying that I could hypothetically look anywhere in the second image to find the correspondence for this point. And you know, when you think about it, that's um, not unreasonable, right? So for example, if I have a bunch of objects and they're all independently moving, well then in theory, that correspondence could occur anywhere, right? So like for example, you know, let's say that I got this guy and he's playing volleyball, right? And so if the camera's moving and the guy's moving, and the ball is moving, you know, then you can imagine that kind of in theory, the correspondence for the ball, depending on how this guy hits it, could be anywhere in the image, right? So in the most general case, when you've got not only camera motion, but also object motion, independent from the camera, then you do have to search all over the image plane to look for that correspondence, right? However, there are some important situations where the correspondence is extremely constrained and we don't have to look all over the image plane, okay? And so that's kind of the concept for today. So the concept for today is called the epipolar geometry between a pair of images. And so the setup basically is that we have um, either a static scene and the camera moves, or we have uh, two pictures of the same scene taken at exactly the same time. And when we think about it, these are really uh, kind of the same statement, right? It's basically saying that the camera is moving, but the scene is not moving, right? And so you know, one example of this is if you're in an empty room and you're just moving your video camera around, nothing is changing. Well, then that's kind of an example of the first case. The second case is when you have a pair of cameras, for example, that are mounted on the ends of a bar and you kind of watch the scene with this stereo camera, right? And that's the way that they, you know, that's one way that they produce a lot of stereo or 3D movies in Hollywood right now is by using a stereo camera, right? Where both cameras are acquiring images of the scene at 30 frames per second but they're offset by some physical distance, right? So, um, you know, this case here is called stereo, and we're going to talk more about that in detail next time, about how do you estimate the correspondence. And so, kind of what I want to set up today is, why does this scenario make finding correspondences easier, okay? And so, um, let's draw a picture to think about why this is true, okay? So let me just say that almost exclusively up to this point in this class, almost everything I've talked about has been in 2D in the sense of saying they're purely things that we can look at based on the images themselves, right? So if we're doing the matting and doing the compositing, all we were doing was looking at those images. There was no 3D information about those scenes that we used to solve any of those problems. Similarly, for feature detection, we were just looking at good regions of pixels in the images by themselves, right? We weren't trying to figure out where those features were in 3D. So kind of starting, you know, I mean, even today we're gonna mostly stay in 2D, but definitely for the following chapters, six, seven, eight, we're gonna be moving into the world of 
3D computer vision, where you really have to know about how things are set up, where the cameras are, and where the points are in the three-dimensional world, right? And so that's kind of the, the shift from 2D to 3D. So here's your first kind of introduction to that type of shift, where if you think about it, these images are produced by cameras, right? And so here, you know, when you have a camera, it's got a aperture or hole through which the light passes. And you know, it used to be that the light would pass and hit a piece of film. Now the light passes through the hole and hits a CCD array. But the principle of the image formation is really more or less the same. And so you've got an image plane, which is kind of like, in this case, I'm drawing the image plane as if it lies between the aperture and the scene. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to draw, you know, the, uh, like this is the camera center and this is the image plane. In reality, right, the image plane is actually behind the hole, right, because the, the light has to come through the center of the camera and then hit whatever is behind the camera. But, you know, if you just kind of mentally flip where that plane are, is around, you're not really changing anything mathematically. So for the moment, I'm just kind of drawing it as if it lies in front of the uh, image center. We'll talk a lot more about this image formation process in chapter six. So just hold your horses on questions about this until we get a couple weeks in. Okay. And so now let's suppose that I see this point on the image plane, okay? So I think about, okay, well, where could that point be in the three-dimensional world, right? So really the way that we form this 2D image is by taking three-dimensional points and kind of drawing a line between the point in the world and the camera center, and where that line hits the image plane is where the pixel appears, right? So that's like saying, okay, you know, if I think about following this out into 3D space, you know, that point could be out here, or it could be out here, or it could be out here, right? So basically, there's kind of a one degree of freedom of where that point could be out in the world, right? Anywhere along this ray that goes from the camera center through the point on an image plane out into the world, right? And now I think about, okay, well, over here in this camera, well, now I want to know where could that correspondence of this point here possibly be, right? And so what I'm doing basically is I'm projecting that line in the world, that ray in the world, back onto the second image plane. So it's like saying, well, if this point was the one in 3D, then it would appear like here. If this was the point, then it would appear like here. If this was the point, it would appear like here. And so you can see that kind of the image of this line in 3D projects down onto a line in the second image. This is like saying that, you know, this point here has to have a correspondence in image 2 somewhere on this special line, okay? And so that means that we can constrain our search to only this line, right? We don't have to look all over the image plane to find the correspondence. If we knew what this line was, we'd only have to look in one place. We just kind of search along the line from left to right, trying to find the best match. And as you can see, that would like totally make our job easier, right? So going from the optical flow, where the correspondences could fundamentally be anywhere, to going to the stereo problem, where the correspondences are really restricted, enables, you know, number one, it enables us to do much more accurate correspondence because things are much more constrained. Um, and number two, it enables some computationally much faster algorithms because suddenly we can pull in lots of concepts from some of the stuff we were talking about before. Question? So the degenerate case where that line doesn't project to a line but projects into a point. So the degenerate case where the line doesn't project it's to a line. It's a stupid thing where they're pointing basically right at each other. Right. So there, there are a couple cases where, so first of all, I think the main thing is that, yeah, okay, so you're saying that if, if the, you've got two cameras that are literally looking across the you know road for each other, right? So that's like a crazy case, right? So in that case, you never actually get any correspondences because you'd never see the same actual 3D points, right? You're seeing the back of one thing and the front of it from the other side, right? So let's not talk about that case. Um, but I will say that you do have to have the case where the cameras are physically separated, right? So I mean, if the camera is just rotating around, these f-polar lines don't exist. In fact, what we learned before was uh, earlier in this chapter, we learned that if a camera is purely rotating, like you're on your vacation taking the vacation pictures, then the images from any two uh, camera positions are relayed to each other by this projective transformation, right? So in that case, life is even easier, right? There's only eight parameters of this projective transformation to estimate, and they put the entire image planes into correspondence. So when you're just rotating the camera, you should be estimating a projective transformation. When the camera is physically separated, 
then you've got this uh, polar geometry, right? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So there are some kind of corner cases where the epipolar geometry doesn't exist. But any time where the cameras are, are separated and you're not maybe in this pathological case, then, then you should be fine. I mean, even here, there's really only one uh, bad line, and that's when you're pointing right in the middle, right? So in theory, this line here would still project to a line somewhere on this camera, right? So it's not like the whole epipolar geometry is destroyed. It's just that you can't infer something about one particular ray. So it's still more or less working, right? Even though in that case, you, you would never be able to do anything useful from a computer vision standpoint. OK, so let me pause and ask, does this make sense? This is, this is the key concept of the day, right? Is that you think about how these lines could work. And I guess I have a nicer picture of this. It's basically the same idea, right? So now that's like saying for every point in image one, we know that there is some ray out into space where that 3D correspondence could be. And then that produces a constrained set of possible correspondence locations in image two. OK. OK. And actually, if you think about it, there is this kind of a parallel or a, a mutual relationship between the two images, by which I mean that if you think about um, how are these, so, so that in the same way, you know, I could say, OK, well, now about for this point in image two, I could shoot a ray out into space, and I could look at its projection onto image one. So basically, for every point in either of the images, there's a corresponding epipolar line in the other image, right? Oh, sorry. Oh. Yes, sorry. So I was basically drawing this point and showing you that there was this line here, right? And I could have probably, if I had the foresight, made a nice little animation of this. But if you think about how are these lines kind of traced out, think about it this way. So you can say, OK, here's image plane 1. Here's image plane 2. Here are the camera centers, right? And now think about, um, think about this line connecting the two camera centers. So we call this camera 1, camera 2. This line segment in 3D space is usually called the baseline. I think I mentioned this earlier in the context of wide baseline. I believe when we were talking about SIFT, for example, I was saying that you know usually SIFT descriptors work the best when the cameras are, or the SIFT descriptors are designed for cases where the cameras are fairly far apart. That's the wide baseline case. Otherwise, we could just use Harris corners, for example, when the cameras are close together. So now you think about, OK, this is a plane in 3D space. This is a plane in 3D space. Now I think about this line in 3D space. And I imagine that there's basically a family of planes that can spin around this line, right? So you imagine that the side view is that I have a bunch of planes that can kind of pivot around this line. Think about a big piece of plywood that is pivoting around a pole in front of me, right? So I can basically twirl it in one direction. Every time I move that huge plane, it's going to intersect the image planes in these two places, right? So for one position of the plane, I get one intersection or one pair of line intersections, right? Now I move the plane that's hinging around the baseline a little bit more, and I get some other line, and so on. And so basically, the idea is that you trace out the possible epipolar lines by moving this big 3D plane back and forth on its hinge, right? So kind of all I want to say is that from, from this picture here, Maybe it wasn't immediately obvious that for this point, I have this line. And for this point, I have this line. Maybe it wasn't immediately obvious that those two image one and image two lines were related to each other. But this is kind of an analogy that shows me that actually they come in these, what I would call, conjugate pairs. right? So the kind of conclusion is that if I look back at kind of looking at these image planes as if they're flat, that's like saying that there's a line here and a line here. And every point on this line must have its correspondence on this line and vice versa, right? So fundamentally, I can constrain my search for correspondences by looking along these conjugate epipolar lines, as they're called. The word conjugate here just kind of means that these guys come in pairs, right, in some sense, right? 
And so this is kind of my better picture of that, right? So on the left, I have the picture of the planes twirling around the, the pole, the baseline. And on the right, I have a better picture of what I tried to draw by hand. And you can kind of see that, you know, so if I think about, or another way to think about this is that for any 3D point in space, I can draw a plane that goes through that point and the two camera centers, because it goes three points in the 3D world to find a plane, that plane intersects the image planes in two lines, and those are the epipolar lines. And I know that the correspondence for this, for any point on this plane, has to lie on this pair of lines, right? So that's kind of the, the big picture, is that um, I have this 1D, so basically now what I boil it down to is instead of having a a full generality 2D to 2D correspondence problem, kind of what I have is a set of 1D correspondence problems. So if, if I was looking for correspondence and I wanted to do it for the whole image, I would say, okay, well, first I'm going to search along this line and match it up with that line. And now I'm going to search along this line and match it up to this line, and so on, right? So now I've basically made my life easier by turning my fully generic problem into a series of easier 1D problems. That's the way that we really solve the stereo correspondence problem, in a way. Okay. Um, so one thing that you might uh, notice from my diagram here is I'm kind of drawing these lines in a slanted way. And as you'll see in a minute, that really is the way that these lines typically look in an image. They don't look like they're nice and horizontal, and I'll kind of show you in a second why that's true. Um, so let's just say, generally, you know, slanted. And as, as a preview, I mean, obviously life would be great if these lines actually were like rows of the image, right? Then you can imagine, for those of you that are computer programming type people, then life would be great, right? Because then you can just do a processing along the rows of the image, finding correspondence along each corresponding row. And in fact, that is something that we like to do to images to make the correspondence problem easier, right? So we're going to talk about this process of what's called rectification in the second half of this lecture, where I say, okay, so once we know what these slanted epipolar lines are, how could we transform the images so that the epipolar lines become horizontal, and then you can apply a nice, you know, computer programming algorithm, okay? Um, let me go back to my picture here for a second. So one reason that these are slanted is you can imagine that um, not pictured on this image is the fact that you know, this point here, this is the camera center, belongs to this plane, and so somewhere, in theory, if this image plane was large enough, you know, let me just maybe draw it as an exaggerated thing over here. So let's suppose that I had uh, something like this, and this is like kind of an extreme example. So let's say that we had something like this. So here's the line connecting the two camera centers. And so in theory, if one camera was in the view of the other one, I, could actually, I would actually physically see it, right? And so that would mean that I would have a point here where I would see this camera. This would be where this 3D point corresponding to the camera would project onto the first image plane and vice versa. And if you think about it, since every, since every one of these planes contains this baseline, that means that this projection point has to appear in each of the epipolar lines, right? So basically what I get are sets of epipolar lines that all kind of have to intersect through this point here. Again, if I had a little bit of foresight and made a nice computer-generated example, that might be better. But basically the idea is that as I twirl this plane around, right, I'm looking at where that plane cuts the two image planes, and I can see that if I happen to have both of these guys in the field of view of each other, well, then all of those epipolar lines are going to intersect at one place that I can see on the image plane. And this point here, in each of the cases, is called the epipole. Right? And so, in some sense, this is why all of the epipolar lines are this slanted look is because they all have to converge at a point, right? Now, in typical images, you don't actually see, like if you think about a stereo camera pair or if you think about, you know, taking two images from a different perspective, typically those images are not necessarily so extreme that the 
position of the second camera is visible from the first. And so kind of what often happens in real life is that your F pole is actually somewhere off camera, right? So here's the, here's, you can imagine if I were to extend the uh, image plane, suppose that instead of having finite image planes, these image planes could in theory be going off to infinity. So then the projection of this camera onto the continuation of this plane would be somewhere out here. And so all the F poles would, would intersect uh, out at this point, right? So you kind of would still see this kind of notion that they're all kind of converging to something. But in most image cases in real life, the thing that they're converging to is off to the side somewhere, right? OK. So I'm going to show you, um, well, actually, I guess I can show you an example of this now just to make it a little bit clearer. And then we'll go back to a little bit of math, OK? So it's a little bit hard to see in the um, abstract. So let's go over to MATLAB for a second. OK, so um, let's see. I have to remember how I, uh, oh, nope. Of course, I called it show points instead of this. OK. So. I guess I maybe call this C1 and C2. OK. So in this case, I have two images of the same scene. Nothing's moving, taken from different perspectives. And as I'm going to talk about in just a second, what you can see that I've done is labeled by hand some corresponding points between these images, right? So. Again, it's a little bit confusing because this is kind of a you know a symmetric on four sides object. But here, for example, this is the front view of this temple, and I can see that these four points on the balcony correspond to these four points. This is like the left hand tip corresponding to this point over here, you know. And so you can see I've marked some points on what, from this perspective, is the front face and the side face, and I've marked the, marked the corresponding points over here. So we're going to talk about later in the lecture how these points. So basically, the way I usually estimate this f-polar geometry is by labeling, either with automatically generated features or by hand, some good correspondences. And I use those to estimate where these lines should be. Okay. So let's, let's suppose for a second that I've done that estimation problem. And now I want to actually show the f-polar lines. And so um, now the question is, how did I phrase this? Sorry. Let's see what this function is called. It is called show f lines. M1, M2, F. OK. So I've previously estimated where these f polar lines are. And so now what you're going to see is every time I click in the left image, it's going to generate a f polar line in the right image. OK, so let me click, for example, on this point in image 1. So if you look at it, these uh, correspondences would make sense, right? It's easiest to see the correspondences on the surface of the building. So here I, I can see that fundamentally over here, the epipolar line seems to go along this brown border of the building. And you can see that, yes, you know, all those points basically correspond to the border of the building over here. And if you think about how this line follows along the sidewall, right, it kind of goes a little bit above the brown border going around the other side. And here again, that line goes a little bit above the corresponding edge. And so if I click on a few more points, we can generate some more epipolar lines. It's kind of hard to, uh, let's just generate a few of these guys here. Now I'm kind of filling up the image with lines. So here again, let's think about how these correspondences make sense, right? So. Here, um, let's think about this this line here, right? So yes, I immediately found that it, the correspondence does lie on the corresponding epipolar line. 
what else is on that line? Well, for example, there's some point on the roof that's about a third of the way over, right? And again, I can see that, yes, that correspondence is basically, um, let's see, yeah, so basically it's up over here. And this actually is a little bit disconcerting because I can see that while the correspondence is there, actually the correspondence has switched uh, places in some sense, right? So here, the roof point and the corner point you know, appear in the order one, two, and here they appear in the order two, one, right? So there's actually been a switch of order in this case, which, as we'll see in the next lecture, could be kind of complicated for finding the correspondence. So while the correspondence does exist, it may not exist in such a nice one, you know, left to right way. Um, but you can see the rest of this stuff looks pretty good, right? So for example, um, you know, here's another epoidal line that goes kind of almost along the brown lines, both on the side and the front of the building. And you can see that, yes, you know, if I was searching for correspondences, they would be in the right places, right? And here, in both these images, you can see that these epoidal lines are kind of diagonal and somehow feel like they're converging to some point way off beyond the image plane, but they would intersect if you drew them all, you know, to their point of infinity, right? Okay. So this is, this is kind of a real example of what the epoidal lines would look like for a real image. Okay. So let me just pause and ask comments or questions. Yes? So I, I think, so if I understand this correctly, like these uh, conjugate epoidal lines, uh, if you knew, like, so you could, like, so for example, when you have those corresponding uh, points, mm -hmm. and, uh, you draw these. So if you knew, like, the epoidal lines mm -hmm. uh, between the two conjugate epoidal Yep. Right, okay, so that's an interesting question. So the question is, if you knew the pairs of conjugate polar lines, then couldn't you go further and estimate the 3D orientations of the cameras? And so we'll talk about that in the next chapter. It, it turns out that yes, you can in certain circumstances, right? So basically, there are uh, methods for kind of bootstrapping your way from the correspondences to this epolar geometry to the real camera positions, right? There are some caveats to how that process can work, though, right? So, for one thing, you know, one one problem with that approach is that there are. M it turns out that there are several, or there's a whole family of possible camera locations that project to the same epipolar lines, right? So you're you're not going to get a unique solution. You can put some constraints on things to get your solution to be almost unique, right? Um, you know, one, one very obvious way to think about why it's not unique is, you know, suppose that I was to take my stereo rig and I was to um, move it around in 3D space, right? So I've immediately got a, uh, you know, rigid motion, you know, rotation and translation that's going to give me six parameters of, you know, uh, uncertainty, right? On top of that, you know, if I were to kind of um, keep the geometry the same, but I think that if you were to kind of uh, make the whole rig bigger, right? If you were to make the physical separation of the cameras larger, but but also change the angles, you could basically get a scale ambiguity, right? So there are there are definitely some complications, right? We'll talk about that some more, as well as unfortunately projective complications, not just rigid motions, but also more complicated stuff. But yes, that is the fundamental idea behind some of the match moving stuff we'll talk about next. Okay, so other questions or comments? Okay, so what I want to talk about next is how do we, um, you know, how do we encapsulate or quantify these epipolar lines? Um, well, let's think about how to do this. Okay. So the nice thing is that all of the, uh, well, so I guess let's start off by saying that there's this important quantity called the fundamental matrix. Okay. And so the fundamental matrix really kind of gathers together everything I need to know about these epipolar lines. And so it's expressed as the following. So it's a three by three matrix. And it ties together the
image correspondences in this special way. So this basically says that for any correspondence, x, y in one image and x prime, y prime in the other image, this matrix equation has to be true. Okay? And so this this I'm this double arrow thing I'm using to mean corresponding points. Okay. And so this is a really, you know, remarkable way of, of saying things. And so why does this constrain what how does this give me f polar lines, for example? Okay. So um, basically getting Epipolar lines from F. So suppose that I fix, you know, the correspondence in image one. Okay. So the fundamental matrix equation is basically this, right? So again. This here is a three by one vector. This here is a three by three matrix. This here is a one by three vector. And so if I were to fix x, y, then I can take this part here and just multiply this f matrix by x, y. And what I get is basically some other three by one vector, which looks like, let's just call it a, b, c, right? And then if I, write out what this means, this is just saying that I have a x prime plus b y prime plus c equals zero, right? And this is an equation of a line in image two. So this is the f polar line in image two. So I guess I should say fix x y in image one. So if I tell you the point in image one, then I can use this special fundamental matrix to give me the special epipolar line image two. And, you know, kind of vice versa, if I were to switch the roles, if I was to fix x prime, y prime, then I could kind of tie this together into one vector and I would find the special line in image one, right? And so that's exactly how I drew, or that's, how, that's exactly how I drew the lines in that MATLAB example, is I knew this three by three matrix F, and every time I clicked on a point in image one, I did this process to figure out what the corresponding line that I should draw over an image two should be, right? Okay, so I guess, uh, okay, so any questions about that? Does that make sense? Now, let me just say that, um, just a note, remember that we talked about these uh, epipoles, right? So um, basically the epipoles are the places where all of these epipolar lines are going to intersect. Um, so let me just say why that's true. So all epipolar lines intersect at the epipole, e.g. in I1 let's define this special point uh, is on every polar line. And so one way to think about this is that, you know, no matter what the point is in image two, I know that the epipole has to be on that epipolar line. And so this is like saying, I can change all the stuff over here. I can change the x and y however I want, but this matrix equation still has to be true because I know that the f-pole in image one has to be on this line, right? And so the conclusion is that 
since this part is kind of changeable and this part has to equal to zero all the time, the conclusion is that this epipole can be found as an eigenvector of f that has a zero eigenvalue. So what this means is that uh, epipole is an eigenvector of f with eigenvalue zero. And so that kind of tells us a couple of things. So, so one thing to note, I don't want to get too far into it, is that you know in theory f is this three by three matrix. I mean, well, not in theory, f is a three by three matrix, right? Now you might think that there are basically nine possible numbers that I could put into that three by three matrix. The fact that this f has a zero eigenvalue means that actually there's one less degree of freedom than nine, for sure. And also one thing to think about is that in theory, I could multiply this f by any scalar number. So I could multiply all the numbers by two, and this equation would definitely still be true. And so there's one more degree of freedom there that you lose. And so basically what this comes down to is that uh, f is three by three, but has seven degrees of freedom. And so the reason I'm saying this is that when you estimate f, you need to make sure that the f that you estimate kind of has this important property, right? You can't just um, estimate any nine numbers and hope that it works. OK, so how would we go about estimating the fundamental matrix, right? So like, you know, I've kind of shown you once I know it, kind of how I use it and what the epipolar lines look like, but how do I get that in the first place, okay? And so um, estimating the fundamental matrix, I mean, there are many ways to do it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's many ways to do it that are maybe better than I'm gonna show you right now, but this is the basic idea. So estimating the fundamental matrix. Well, you know, the way I think about this is that how do we estimate a projective transformation, for example? Well, we got a bunch of point correspondences, and we said, okay, well, if I was trying to estimate a projective transformation, there are eight degrees of freedom, so I needed to have at least four point correspondences. Hopefully, I had more to give me some sort of robustness, and then I solved this direct linear transform that we showed a couple lectures ago to find, you know, the best set of eight parameters that was consistent with all the correspondences that I created, right? Do we, we do exactly the same thing here, right? So basically, the first step is to um, obtain uh, feature correspondences. And so again, this is exactly, you know, this is one of the reasons why we talked about stuff in chapter four. So these feature correspondences, you know, if the cameras are not too far apart, they could come from Harris corners. If the cameras are further apart, they could come from SIFT features, right? So I've got, or, or I could manually click on them if I wanted to be super duper sure, okay? So first I obtain feature correspondences. Um, usually there is a step of uh, normalizing them. To have, you know, zero mean and standard deviation one, basically. So what I mean by that is that, again, if all your correspondences are like way off into the left-hand corner of the image or if they're not centered, well, what I want to do is I just do a little normalization step, a linear transformation that brings all the correspondences to be centered at the origin and to have a nice spread of not more, you know, a nice spread of one. And so I think that this is one of the, I think I assigned this as a homework problem to basically show kind of how this normalization process works. Again, all you're doing is you're, you're basically applying a little linear transformation to the correspondences before you put them into this process. And so now, if you think about it, what is our fundamental matrix equation? Well, it looks like uh, looks like this, right? So every correspondence gives me basically one uh, constraint, right? So if I think about writing this out, this is like saying, okay, well, um, each correspondence generates one constraint on F. By which I mean, if I think about multiplying out 
this matrix So again, this is a one by three, this is a three by three, this is a three by one, right? When I start to multiply this out, right, I can think about, okay, well, what's the first, you know, what's one of these terms gonna look like? Well, I'm gonna have, you know, X prime, Y prime, one transpose times F one, one X plus F one, two Y plus F one, three, and some other similar stuff equals zero. And then when I multiply this out, I'm going to get something that looks like x prime f11 x plus x prime f12 y plus x prime f13 plus a bunch of other terms equals zero. And then again, I can kind of organize that into stuff I know and stuff I don't know, right? What I don't know are the f's, that's what I'm trying to find out. What I do know are all the x's and y's. And so I kind of make this into a matrix that looks like, okay, you know, I have a long matrix like this. Here are my unknowns, F11 through F33. And then every line is something that looks like, okay, so this is gonna be like X1, X1 prime. That's the thing that multiplies F11. What multiplies F12 is uh, Y1, X1 prime, and so on, right? So I'm gonna get basically a N, where N is the number of correspondences, by nine is the number of columns, this is gonna be a nine by one matrix of unknowns. And so this is the way I would kind of set up that linear system, right? And so again, this is one of those uh, helpful, so I mean, I think that again, this is one of the things I always like to kind of emphasize when I'm teaching a class is seeing a problem and setting it up into the corresponding linear system that you would then put into MATLAB to solve, right? So kind of, it's a good, it's a good skill to be able to have is to transform problems into the corresponding linear system, okay? So now how would I solve this problem? So at this point, what I have is basically a big linear system. So I basically have a big linear system that looks like a f equals zero, where this is some n by nine matrix. This is some nine by one vector. And so the way I solve this problem is I compute what's called the singular value decomposition of A. And so, show of hands on who's ever heard of the singular value decomposition? A few people, but not everybody. So basically, the SVD is kind of like a generalization of an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition that you do when the matrix is not square, okay? Um, so I don't have, unfortunately, the time to, to teach you the whole SVD, but basically this is a very common linear algebra tool, okay? And the way this works is that this is gonna be a um, nine by nine diagonal matrix. And the entries of this diagonal are, are what are called the singular um, values, right? They're kind of like the eigenvalues, but in a more generic way. And so, the next step is let F be the last column of V. What this kind of means is that um, it's like saying that I want, the, I want to find the lowest singular value, right? In theory, if the correspondences were perfect, one of these singular values would be exactly zero. That kind of corresponds to the fact that we know that F has a, you know, has a zero eigenvalue. In practice, the correspondences that I obtain or that I click on may not be exactly perfect. And so what's gonna happen usually is that there's gonna be one very, very small eigenvector or singular va value of F and that's the one that I wanna find. So basically I pick F out of here and then I would uh, reshape into a three by three matrix call that F hat. And so this kind of goes from my vector back into a matrix. This is almost what I want, right? Because what I want is this three by three fundamental matrix. The problem is at this stage, there's still no guarantee that the 
three by three matrix that I obtain exactly has a zero eigenvalue, right? It could be a, it could have an eigenvalue that's very close to zero, but not exactly zero. And so the last step is basically to um, compute SVD of f hat, which is going to be again some other thing. This is going to be a three by three matrix now because f is three by three, and I zero out the lowest uh, singular value of d, and then recompute this thing. So kind of what I'm doing is I'm forcing the f to have a zero eigenvalue by kind of uh, zeroing this guy out. And then I usually have to do some sort of renormalization process. Since I did some stuff to the correspondences initially, I have to undo that stuff at the end. And again, that's not very hard to do. And you can see in the book that it's easy to, to re, uh, re-estimate f in the right space. Okay, so this algorithm is very, I mean, this is very easy to do in MATLAB and you can get, I, I think actually either I did it or I pulled some code off the web that did it. And so this is a very straightforward algorithm. It was called the eight point algorithm, a very famous computer vision algorithm. Um, the reason it's called the eight point algorithm is that in theory, you only need to have eight points to get a solution that if all the points are accurate, gives you the exact answer, right? Of course, in practice, you generally want to have more than eight points. You want to have, like in my example with the temple, I probably had about 20 or 25 points, right? So um, typically what you'd like to do is you'd like to um, get as many good points as you can, use those to estimate the polar geometry. Again, just like with uh, the fundamental, or just like with the project transformations, you know, it could be that if you generate these correspondences automatically, that some of them may be kind of crummy. And so you probably need to use some sort of outlier rejection like ransack to robustly throw out the ones that are not really underlyingly corresponding to the right fundamental matrix. And so just in the same way that you can use um, ransack for feature matching, you can use ransack, for, well, it's the same kind of thing, right? You're using ransack to throw out features that are not consistent with the epipolar geometry, right? So that's something that we could add on to, for example, SIFT matching, right? So SIFT matching has a bunch of outlier rejection uh, heuristics to say, okay, well, these are reasons why I don't think these are corresponding points. Now we could layer on even one more, one more thing to say, I should never generate SIFT matches that are not consistent with some true fundamental matrix, right? Um, and in fact, you know, that's kind of putting the cart before the horse because some people do use SIFT matches to estimate the fundamental matrix in the first place. So there's this kind of back and forth. But that's the basic idea. Question? I think your dimensions on V are wrong in step five. My dimensions of V are wrong in step five. It's nine by one because the last column on nine by one is the first only column. So let's go. So this is an N by nine matrix. No, he's saying the when you wrote the column is Oh, okay. should be a 9 by 9. So V itself is 9 by 9, right? And I'm taking the last column of that, which should be a 9 by I 1. I yeah. there. Okay. I thought you were saying V is a 9 by 1. Oh, yes. No, I'm, the last column is 9 by 1. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Other comments or questions? Okay. So... What I just want to talk about quickly now is, uh, so the subject of the whole next lecture is going to be, like I said, stereo correspondence, right? So once I have these epipolar lines, what I want to do is I want to now search along them for correspondences, okay? And those of you that are you know, computer programmers can imagine that it would be kind of a pain to have to search along these non horizontal lines, right? You'd have, to, you'd have to be searching along this resampling, you know, resampling the images along the way, it would kind of suck, right? And so what would we like to do? Well, we'd like to turn these epipolar lines into horizontal lines. So kind of what I want to do is I want to take these two images and warp them in such a way that after I've been warping them, the lines are all horizontal, right? Then life would be very good because then I could just step along corresponding rows, right? And so um, that's exactly what this next process is. So 
Um, that process is called rectification. So it's kind of like warping images so that uh, conjugate epipolar lines oops, correspond to image rows. And sometimes you hear these called scan lines. Kind of because, you know, it used to be if you had a raster display that was kind of constantly using electron beam to produce, you know, the rows of your TV set, those are scan lines, right? And so the idea is that I want to turn the epipolar lines into scan lines. Okay. And so uh, this is kind of a schematic of the process that I want to create, right? So in the middle are the two original images with their possibly slanted and diagonal epipolar lines. In this case, I kind of drew them where the f poles are visible on the image, although it may not be true in the real world. And so those two images are related to each other by the fundamental matrix F that I could estimate from correspondences, right? Now what I want to do is I want to warp these images using transformations H1 and H2 so that the f polar lines become horizontal, okay? And so that's the goal of what I want to be able to do. And so, going back to my notes here, yeah, sorry. So go, going back to my notes, um, each image has a rectifying projective transformation, H, applied to it. So that's like saying that, again, I have my original images. These are related to each other by the original fundamental matrix. Now I apply some weird transformations. This is going to become, these images now are not going to be square anymore. They're going to look kind of strange. But, you know, after I apply H1 here and H2 here, if this is my warped image 1 and this is my warped image 2, then life should be good, right? And I want, so th let's think about what should this new fundamental matrix between these guys be? So, um, let's write that down. So, what should the new fundamental matrix between the warped images be? Well, it turns out to have a very simple form. So why does this work? Well, let's think about it. So that's like saying that if I have a correspondence, this in one image, here's my special fundamental matrix, and I have the correspondence here in the other image. So if I multiply this out, what does this say? So this is going to be 0, y, I'm oh, sorry, 0, 1, negative y equals 0. Multiply this out, I get y prime minus y equals 0, or y prime equals y, right? So that tells me that the fundamental constraint, right, is that, you know, if I had, um, if I had this point, x comma y here, and I fixed y, that's like saying, hey, you know, your new epipolar line is the place where y prime equals y. Sorry, that's kind of so small. Right, so that's kind of like saying that, hey, you know, the only constraint that I have is that the two, you know, y coordinates have to be exactly the same, right? So instead of having this weird offset line, my lines are nice and parallel, right? Nice and straight. And also the way I've done this, lines them up 
uh, one to one so that line 30 of image one is the same as line 30 of image two, right? So I mean, in theory, I could do the rectification in such a way that the epipolar lines were still horizontal, but they could be like offset. So like line five of image one corresponds to line 30 of image two. Really what I want to do is I want to make this so that I can just kind of go loop around, you know, loop over the entire height of the image and process every row, you know, with the same index going from up to down, right? So this is really the best case scenario, okay? Um, the process of how you actually do this is a little bit tedious, and so I don't want to go through the gory details right now. But the basic idea is that, um, let me see, sorry, crud on my thing here. So the idea behind the process, so how do I make these epipolar lines horizontal, right? So actually, if you think about it, that kind of contradicts in some sense what I told you earlier about all these lines meeting at the epipole, right? So kind of what I'm trying to do is you think about um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a projective transformation to each image, which is kind of like rotating the camera view, right? Because we talked about how when I rotate the camera, I get a projective transformation. And so here, if I'm on the original setup where I've got my epipolar lines that are converging to this epipole over here, well, how would I get those things to be horizontal, or, you know, parallel to each other? Well, what I would have to do is I would have to rotate this image plane until it became parallel to the baseline, right? So that would be like saying if both of the images were pointed straight ahead and the image planes were in a configuration that kind of looked like this, right? In that case, there would never be any intersection of the baseline with the image plane, right? And that would mean that when I rotated my, you know, plywood around the, you know, baseline, it would intersect these image planes in nice horizontal lines, right? So that's kind of what we're trying to do in the rectification process is we're basically taking the uh, image plane of each camera and rotating them so that I make the image planes parallel to the baseline, right? And in that way, I never have any worries about those epipolar lines intersecting, right? And then, you know, I need to be, so, so in theory, right, um, I need to do a little bit of extra footwork to make sure that the epipolar lines are exactly how I want them, right? Because it would certainly be true, kind of looking from above, or I'm mean, just looking from the side. So this would still um, be a case where the, if I was kind of thinking about, you know, um, this is again kind of a schematic view. Here, this is a case where again, I could get parallel lines, but in one of the images, they wouldn't be uh, horizontal, right? And so there's an extra degree of freedom to make sure that both these guys have lined up this way. Also, it's possible that if one of these image planes, like in the top view, if one of these image planes was like much further away than the other, then the corresponding epipolar lines would kind of be, you know, not equally spread out, right? So there are basically a bunch of little homework problems to not that you're going to do homework, but there are a bunch of little nitpicky things to make sure that, in fact, I get the lines to be exactly lined up with each other. There are a bunch of degrees of freedom of these rectifying projective transformations to make the um, epipolar lines line up. And so if you look in the book, there is one example of a rectification algorithm that tries to do a good, as good of a job as possible. Number one, satisfying this constraint that at the end of the day, the row indices have to be the same. And number two, you know, when you think about it, I can, um, you know, there are still some degrees of freedom in terms of trying to make the images not so distorted, right? So I could have, for example, a situation like this, where say these are my uh, lines, and then suppose that I wanted to stretch this image out like crazy after I did this, right? or make this guy like super tiny, right? So those would still be technically rectified, but they would be really hard to work with, right? So in some sense, what I want to do is I want to minimize the overall distortion of the image pair so that nothing is 
artificially squeezed or stretched. Because, you know, again, when I do this resampling, I'm actually, you know, I have to go into the image and I have to resample pixels to build this new rectified image. I don't want to incur any over-stretching of the image or over-squishing of the image that will produce kind of bad results for my stereo cor correspondence algorithm later. And so in MATLAB, I've already um, put together a example of this. Make sure I remember the syntax. Right, so I've already rectified a couple images. same images. And so now, if I look at these two images, you can see that they are kind of weirdly warped, right? I mean, this, the one on the right doesn't look so bad. The one on the left is definitely a little bit squished. And so you could argue that maybe I could, you know, make that one a little bit wider, right? But now, you know, I've got my same thing where I can click on a point in the image. And now you can see that actually, um, this is actually an interesting choice because my green line happens to be right on top of one of these brown lines that bisects the front of the thing. You can see that the correspondences, you know, you think about, you know, look at the way that the rectified epilar line is just like running right parallel to this brown line along the side. You can see the correspondences look good. So if I actually click on the brown line here, you can see that I've actually kind of done this in such a way that now I can really just search left to right, hopefully along this pair of lines, and obtain correspondence. And even in the places where things are a little bit weird, so for example, uh, I believe that this was the one that we looked at earlier. Again, now the corner and the corresponding point on the roof occur on the same line in the image, right? And so um, if I kind of click on some more points, like here again, you can see that this rooftop point and this weather vane or something, they're sticking out the tip of those two things. They're on the same row here, and they're also both in the same row here, kind of obscured by the tree, right? And so this is what you would call a rectified image pair. Right? So your images now look a little bit goofy, but your correspondence problem co computationally is going to be a lot easier, OK? OK, so let me pause and ask any questions or comments. Okay, so where we're going next time basically is now we're going to start from the assumption that we have a stereo pair that is rectified like this. And so now the question is, how does our you know optical flow problem, our correspondence problem, where we're trying to find a dense correspondence between all the points over here and all the points over here, how does that make our computation process easier and more robust when we know the epipolar geometry and everything is good? So now that's going to lead us to some algorithms that kind of are much more um, kind of easy to implement in terms of um, OpenCV and stuff like that, right? So for example, you know, a lot of optical flow started from this world of continuous time, partial differential equations, right? You saw I was doing partial differential equations when we talked about optical flow. In stereo, we're going to be much more in the discrete world of saying, okay, so now I'm going to basically kind of imagine that I'm going to index the correspondence problem by inching along this line in the image and then asking what is like my integer number of pixels offset for the correspondence in the other image, right? So now I've kind of trying to solve an integer problem. Or I could say, okay, in terms of units of half pixels or quarter pixels. But the problem becomes discrete instead of continuous. So that's where we're going.